Good morning. I think we're the last panel between everyone and lunch, so we're going to be very cognizant of that. And um, my name is Nancy Kirshner Rodriguez, as they just said. I am based here in California for the Oceantic Network. I want to thank Adam and Offshore Wind California leadership for inviting me again to participate, and particularly in um, this panel. And um, just to let you know that I think I, I, I either know a lot of you or I should know a lot of you because I know we have a lot of, we share a lot of members. And Oceantic, we just completed our international partnering forum in New Orleans. We were so glad Adam was there with us and so many of you. And I, I think this panel, this is the perfect timing. I was, I was um, reflecting that it's basically been six years since I've been working on offshore wind, so I know there's a lot of much more experienced people, but six years in offshore wind seems like 60 sometimes. Um, and at the same time, one year really makes a big difference. We are seeing the building blocks as everyone is talking about. And as I was listening to the last panel, I was thinking um, how fantastic it is, the coalition that we've actually built. Most of, most of the, um, the uh, labor unions have partnered with uh, Dan and OWC and us and now Ports, and we've been actively um, trying to make the case here and other places um, for the, the big burden that we have and the challenge, but what we need to do to build out our ports. So um, I know you know that there's been a lot of different studies. NREL has done some amazing studies under the leadership of Matt Shields and others. The state of California with um, Moffitt, Nickel, and Exodus and others have put together some really important studies. Um, my organization, we put together a study that is focused on the, the um, financing and timelines, and you'll hear a lot more about that from our lead author, Brian Sabina. And we all know that California needs port infrastructure, and you, you've heard it from other panels. So we know um, floating offshore wind is gonna create a lot of jobs. We know it's going to transform renewable energy markets in the West, but it will not happen without ports that can assemble and deploy the turbines and also provide um, potential space for other pieces of the puzzle, so to speak. Um, a big thing that we know is that timing and a timeline for investment of dollars is really important. And so that's why we're all here today. I think that um, for me though, what Sam Eaton, I told him I was gonna say this, he said, when he said yesterday, what is the cost of inaction? And so that we are going to talk this panel um, about what we've been doing on ports issues, all the positives, and I want to have each of you um, introduce yourselves here today. I think we'll start with SARP um, and go through and tell the audience what you're most proud of accomplishing in the past year as well. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, great to be here. Thanks for sticking with us on the last day of this conference. Uh, great crowd and um, uh, very pleased to be here with many colleagues and, and friends. Um, my name is Sarp Ersoylu. I'm the, uh, the West U.S. Sports and Maritime Manager for Burns and McDonald. Um, very brief bio on myself. I'm originally from Istanbul, Turkey. I'm a mechanical engineer. I moved to California about 25 years ago or so and been in the, uh, the port infrastructure business uh, well over 20 years now. And I've uh, been fortunate enough to work on various projects involving terminals, um, waterways, rail infrastructure, and so forth. Um, and primarily really working with the California ports. And um, a little bit about my company as well, Burns & McDonald was founded in 1898 and um, based out of Kansas City, Missouri. And uh, we are really a full service infrastructure provider. We do everything from you know, front end planning, high level advisory work to design and construction as well. 
and uh, we operate in various different markets and water and transportation and, and power uh, as well as uh, federal um, and obviously in you know on the power side we've been involved in the offshore wind um, arena for for some years um, been involved in most of the projects on the on the east coast so far so um, so we're very excited about the you know the the opportunity for um, offshore wind and coming to California as well and to answer the last portion of the question about what we're proud of, we were involved, one of the projects we were involved with was the South Fork Wind Project in New York. And uh, we all saw that finally went live um, last year, so that's, that's a great proud moment, very important early milestone in that process. And uh, we were the project manager for the um, uh, onshore substation piece on that, uh, on that project too, so that's now providing power to you know, uh, homes and, and businesses in New York. And, um, we're definitely proud of that and on the port side at a more personal level very busy uh, working with uh, a lot of the California ports right now with their decarbonization efforts too it's it's interesting hmm. we talk about offshore wind and ports in that sense but it kind of goes full circle because ports are big users of power themselves and they're in the process of actually decarbonizing their um, operations too and and uh, that's another challenge and a deadline ahead of us, and we're you know very heavily involved in you know uh, working with that um, the last couple of years as well. So, great, Suzanne. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Good morning, everybody. Suzanne Pleasia, Senior Director, Chief Harbor Engineer at the Port of Long Beach, and I've been uh, working at the Port of Long Beach uh, in our Engineering Services Bureau for over 28 years now. So it's been a long career at the Port of Long Beach. Um, and you know, as an engineer, uh, you know, I was really attracted to working for the Port of Long Beach. And as a civil engineer, it's really that attraction around developing public infrastructure for the greater good that attracted me to work at the Port of Long Beach and has kept me there. And when offshore wind came up, you know, it really spoke to me about, you know, the, the idea that we could develop these large public infrastructure projects to serve the greater good here in California. And so I think just a little bit of context around the Port of Long Beach, um, because not everybody really realizes, um, even within our own community, that we exist. Uh, port, ports are really pillars in our community that stand up and create this uh, larger economic engine and benefits for our region. But really a lot of people don't know that, that we're there. And so for those in the audience, uh, the Port of Long Beach is a trustee of state tidelands uh, that have been granted to us by the state legislature. And our mission is to manage and develop those state tidelands in furtherance of the public trust doctrine. And most people know us uh, solely as a busy container port. Um, but we have been uh, one of the largest capital programs in, of any energy or non-energy port in the nation uh, for over a decade running. And a major focus of that capital program is about reducing our impacts on our community from our operations. And Sarp, you, you touched on that. That is a major driver for us. Uh, we just finished developing a $1.5 billion um, near zero, almost a fully electric terminal, uh, Long Beach Container Terminal at $1.5 billion, a huge investment. Um, but that is all part of our transition to zero emission container terminal operations uh, by 2030. It's an enormous goal for one of the busiest container ports in the nation. And so, you know, for us, this was uh, really a calling because as we transition to SARP's point, transition to zero emissions, the amount of electricity that we're going to need to do to support that operations is enormous. So we are fully invested in California's success of offshore wind, so there's sufficient renewable, reliable, zero carbon energy powering that grid as we plug more of our operations into that grid. And so you asked me, like, what, what are we most proud of in the last year? And, you know, it's really, as I reflect back, I am so grateful and proud to work for the Port of Long Beach in an organization that uh, supports these types of efforts around to reduce our, our operation, uh, 
at the impact from our operation and support a global, really, goal of decarbonization and the state's goals around offshore wind. And the enormous support that we've received from our board and our executive director, because it's not just words and declarations. They have put funding behind these efforts, and we've made tremendous progress in partnership with a whole host of uh, our team at the Port of Long Beach. It's an all-hands-on-deck operation. Uh, communications, government relations, engineering, and of course our environmental planning and all, all of our consultant partners. It's been an enormous effort and progress that we made over the last year, and so I'm really proud to work uh, for the Port of Long Beach. Thank you. Brian. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nancy, and um, thank you first uh, to Adam and the whole team here at Offshore Wing California for putting on another great conversation. This is really important. Um, for those who I haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Brian Sabina. I have the privilege of being the CEO for Clean Energy Terminals. We are a California-based private uh, project developer that is exclusively focused on investing in and developing the port infrastructure that's needed to deploy uh, and service offshore wind. Uh, that We also like to say that's the same port infrastructure that is essential for growing clean energy careers around our ports, and it's the same sort of port infrastructure that's essential for creating local business opportunities from offshore wind in our communities. Um, at our core, and I think this resonates with a lot of the folks up here, we think infrastructure development and port development is economic development. Um, I come from an economic development background, um, and the implication of that is that if we're going to do these projects, we need to do them in the right way, and for us that means a community-oriented way, in a way that listens to our tribal partners, in a way that um, is environmentally responsible, uh, is moving towards and, and is achieving zero emission uh, targets, in a way that uses uh, union labor. So all of that is a core to how we think about projects and how we think about the impact that port projects can have. Um, in terms of what am I most proud of over the last year since we were last up on the stage, um, I think there's a number of things in the clean energy side that we're really excited about. You know, we're growing our team. We have projects on, on both coasts now. Um, spoiler alert, uh, in the next week or so, we're going to be announcing a, a major private equity investment into our, into our company. Uh, that's quite fun for us. Um, all of that's exciting. But I think the thing I'm most proud about is that we've, I think, reshaped the narrative over the last year about the scale and the shape and the size of the offshore import challenge. Maybe four or five years, you know, not even two or three years ago, we were talking about offshore wind ports as a four billion dollar, you know, challenge or, or gotcha. Over the last year, with the help of Suzanne putting out information, Chris putting out information, the AB525 report, the work that we did with the Oceanic Network to lay out a national roadmap for how much it's going to take to deliver offshore wind infrastructure to support our long-term goals, we now view this as a 36 billion dollar problem, and that's incredibly important. Because if you're trying to solve a $4 billion problem, you're going to bring $4 billion solutions. We're actually trying to solve a $36 plus billion problem. And therefore, we need to bring $36 billion solutions to the table. And I think that's the thing that I'm very excited about and proud about over the last year that, that we've been contributing and driving that conversation. And Chris, I'm glad well, to have you here. <laughs> first, I just want to point out my feet don't touch the floor in this chair. <laughs> <laughs> um, for those of you that know me well, I was three foot nine inches tall when I started high school and I had a top locker, so <laughs> this is not uncommon for me. So I'll fidget a little bit, um, but uh, thank you. So yeah, I'm grateful to be here. I'm, I really appreciate the invitation that was extended. I want to recognize uh, Rob Homeland, our development director. This is really his, uh, his wheelhouse. He has made himself a subject matter expert. Uh, he's remarkable to work with. He decided that he wanted to do some stuff with his family. Hey, work's temporal, family's eternal. And so I'm really great to, to have the opportunity to be here, but I want to recognize him. This is really the, the um, these are his efforts. Um, you know, myself, my background, so I'm the executive director at the Port of Humboldt Bay. Uh, we are once the main timber port here in the West, along with uh, Portland and Seattle. Uh, very large, deep roots in fisheries, aquaculture, and timber. Uh, today, we have aquaculture in our port, and we do export some fiber. But offshore wind is an absolute economic uh, redevelopment, as Brian uh, shared. And we have an opportunity. We were one of the first to come out and propose a 168-acre development that'll be a staging and integration site, as we know from the studies that were prepared. 
Uh, we're one of the ports that really can do that along with, with Long Beach. We were the first two that identified they can kind of do it all. And so we're relying on our backgrounds and the things we've done to get there. But um, you know, I come from the real estate world. I started out as a Volkswagen Porsche Audi uh, technician, and here I am building a wind port. Imagine that. Um, <laughs> But I, I, I think the thing when we talk about what are we proud of, um, we have a lot of accomplishments up in Humboldt, and it's the hard work of our community, it's the hard work of our commissioners, and, and our team. We're a team of 14. People often comment, you know, how are you gonna grow that out? And uh, there's a lot of work ahead of us, so let's recognize that. Let's not uh, sit here and celebrate today. I'm incredibly proud of what we've done with a team of 14, and that's the amazing part. We've got a lot of great counselors we have community members that are engaging with us. We have tribal government that's engaging with us. And these are honest conversations that we're having. We're trying to find a path forward through community engagement, through tribal engagement. We've already brought large resolutions out to the community to really show that not only are we listening, but we're gonna take action. And so we wanna encourage others to do that in their communities and their port projects. Engage with your community. Engage, 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 and don't stop. That's how we're gonna get there. Thank you. Um, I think I, I was going to say earlier that um, probably the best thing for me has been this year has been kind of a combination of what all of you have described. I, I oversee our port and logistics working group, which we worked with Brian for this paper that we did. And um, but I but I feel like we're all singing from the same hymn book. We don't have all the answers. But I think I want to emphasize we need all of you here engaged to get us to the next um, place. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that. So Chris, can you give us a little update of where your project is? You had some exciting news in the last couple of months and then sure. where you're going this year. Well, uh, as many people know, Humboldt Bay was uh, early in the process. We were very grateful to receive some outreach from the state, uh, most specifically GoBiz. Um, early in the process, we looked at a Port Infrastructure Development Grant, or a PIDP grant, and it requires a match. And when you're a small port like Humboldt Bay, we don't have the match to do small recreation uh, projects. We don't have the match to go out and do large-scale projects. We don't have the match. But the state said, hey, we got a call for you. We want to do something big by 2030 and even grow that over time. And so uh, through the California Energy Commission, we received about $10.5 million to go out and hire the technical experts necessary to help us develop this port. And we, in addition to that, have money in there for match. We applied for PIDP, I think twice. We didn't get it, but the state stuck with us. They were part of the vision. They understood that we answered the call. And uh, ultimately, we received a PIDP grant, which will take us all the way through permitting and design. And so in the next couple of years, we should have on the shelf a fully permitted project, a port project, that is, a terminal, ready to go for staging and integration. Well, we're permitting 168 acres. 40 of those acres is what we call the minimum viable project. Um, taking that a step further, uh, we received a grant from, uh, infra grant from DOT for $426 million. And uh, so we're well positioned to go. It's important that when we talk about how we received that grant, we recognize uh, Crowley Wind. Crowley was a very big part of us receiving that grant. They worked with us to develop the grant application to do the assessment necessary. And uh, so I, I want to make sure that's recognized and we see out in the industry who these industry partners are and the things that they're that are doing. Uh, education has been huge for us. Our local university, our community college, they're a big part of it, wind energy partners. Uh, I've mentioned tribal government, again, the amount of honesty that we've had there, the amount of ability to see what this could grow up to be, fantastic. Labor, labor's been involved with this project early on. And we recognize our merit shops and the challenges that they face, and we're not looking to eliminate them from things. But we also are using state and federal funds that have requirements to it. We're really excited for the investment that labor's making to train workforces and to change lives. Um, I won't quote one of our state assembly persons, but uh, there is a certain individual, I think you may have heard from him yesterday, I missed it, but talks about jobs versus bullets. And we are in an economy in our community where people 
are challenged and they need another opportunity. And this is a perpetual legacy opportunity that we can have. So, you know, much more to come. Um, nothing to celebrate yet. Eh, maybe 426 million. <laughs> I was gonna say, I was gonna but, say that, that I think is yeah. the largest amount of money that has come from the federal government to a focused offshore wind port, recognizing, yeah. and I yeah. know we're gonna talk more yeah. about what other states have done and what we need to do. We but, have great leadership in the state yeah. who's got us there, it, both in elected officials and are the various leaders that work yeah. in many of the different divisions with the state. So what about you, Suzanne? It's kind of the same question. Yeah, so over the, you know, where are we currently, our current status uh, over the last year? In fact, I was reflecting on this earlier, a year ago today, the Monday of the Pacific Offshore exactly. Wind Summit last year is when we had released our yeah. concept design report um, and put that out there. And so it's been a very busy year. Uh, we've been really working hard on that uh, schedule that we said, you know, schedule can't overemphasize enough the importance of schedule. So we've been working really hard and we released the um, NOI, NOP, and initial study at the end of November in two public scoping meetings, December and January of this last year. So we're working really hard on our environmental documentation and that analysis. Uh, really our major focus right now, uh, we were also working on a business plan, a funding and financing analysis uh, for our project. And really that challenge around funding and financing these major public infrastructure projects that will enable an industry, but you know we can't fund and finance off of a future industry uh, today, right? But it won't exist unless we build this infrastructure. So those fundamental challenges around funding and financing these major infrastructure projects is our core focus in the next six months and really the importance of state funding uh, you know, when we jumped into this, we did jump in this with a whole of government approach, which I'm really glad that we did. Uh, but the state funding and public funding right now is gonna be really, really critical. And we did look to that signal on the AB 209 funds mm -hmm. uh, as part of that signal that the state is gonna help establish that partnership. So we are really gonna be working hard to to work with the state on uh, what that partnership and the state funding associated with that is gonna look like. We're crossing our fingers where those of us that get into the nitty and gritty of the policy discussions, we are crossing our fingers that we can convince the uh, state to keep hold those AB 209 mm -hmm. funds and get them out for the beginnings of the port development. So SARP. Can I, um, ask, can I add a, a quick thing to what um, yeah. Suzanne just said? I, mean, I think one of the interesting things that I've heard over the last day or so is that Nobody is questioning the fact that for, if you're an offshore wind project developer and you're gonna sink four to six billion dollars into an offshore wind project, I need 25 years of, of certainty on revenue. I need a long-term procurement. But yet, like on either side of me, we have folks who are looking to invest a couple billion dollars, uh, five billion dollars into a project and who are trying to do so with four to six years worth of revenue certainty, likely, maybe it's a little bit longer, but I think that's the sort of you know, framework that we need to be having and on a conversation we need to be having around what's going on and what we're being asked as port developers to do. Um, and just, I wanna echo what, what mm -hmm. Suzanne is saying around the importance of building out the market and finding not just ways to push on projects, but also find other smart ways to use financing tools to provide certainty for all of the projects that we're looking yeah. to do. Mm -hmm. So SARP, um, what are your thoughts? I know we there are some big boulders in the road and I know you really have been thinking a lot about these sorts of things. Where, what are some of the current challenges that you see in design, construction? Yeah, just uh, bring in the, the outside mm -hmm. um, engineering perspective perhaps. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll just start by saying, by the way, I think you know both Humboldt Bay Fort and Port of Long Beach, they really deserve a lot of credit. They, they really came out you know, mm -hmm. uh, and pushed us up front where there was so much uncertainty and uh, mm -hmm. that really goes a long way in you know, making the, uh, the initial steps mm -hmm. there too. But I mean, from a technical standpoint, when you look at just solely on the ports, there isn't really anything there that you know, scares me or, or is, is novel 
uh, from a pure technical standpoint. I mean, we can really design and build these ports, whether it's about dredging and reclamation or you know, building these uh, 6,000 pounds a square foot, you know, for beefy wharves and the terminals and whatnot. We've, we've done a lot of that, and um, I think the, the know-how is absolutely there. Um, the, the part that's really more complex in this scheme is uh, if you, you know, make an analogy, like when we do feasibility studies for container terminals, you look at the revenue side, just like, you know, Brian and Suzanne mentioned, and the, the capital yeah. cost side, and you don't want to spend a penny a day sooner than you need to, and that's how you, you know, uh, adjust all your calculations and whatnot. And, and usually there's only like one layer between, you know, the investor and the actual operator of the terminal that's going to be, you know, moving cargo through there too. A lot of the shipping lines have organic, you know, mm. relationships with the terminal operators. And it's, you know, it's a steady market, like Suzanne said. Um, so you can actually, you know, make those numbers work and, you know, uh, adjust your investments. In this case, there's so many players in this chain right. to make the revenue, um, you know, uh, as estimates reliable. And, uh, and I think one thing I've noticed on this conference too, a couple of years ago, we were talking about um, more of the high level stuff with the, you know, the, uh, uh, the new floating uh, technologies that's needed and whatnot. This time around, I think I heard a lot more realistic talk about, well, how about transmission distribution, the, the power purchase agreements, because ultimately, you know, the revenue is really gonna f flow from that edge of the, mm -hmm. the chain there. And I think there's still, um, a lot of uncertainty there, and everybody, all the players in the market are kind of looking at that too to gain an idea. And uh, so, that the funding um, and the capital investment, you know, uh, um, challenges are really going to be depending on, you know, uh, providing some clarity and framework mm -hmm. there. So then, folks like Brian and others can come in and, you know, just make investment decisions. And at that point, I mean, for us, it's. Um, you know, you can you can react to you know uh, uh, design and construction needs fairly quickly, um, but we just need to keep in mind that ports take a long time to build, right. and um, yeah. including the permitting and whatnot too. So you know, it's not something that you can press a button and it's going to be there tomorrow kind of thing. So we we need to really kind of work that schedule back to um, you know uh, start on time. So Brian, um, thank you, sorry, Brian, we've been talking about the staging and integration yep. ports, but we know that California is going to need a network of ports. So can you talk about some of the other ports that we're thinking about needing, or yeah. the, the studies have also defined? Yeah, ha happy to talk about this. I mean, let's be clear that the, the most important part of our port supply chain are going to be the folks who are sitting on either side of me who are delivering the staging and integration terminal um, in my prior role, we built the New Jersey Wind Port, a billion dollar plus project, uh, quite, quite similar to what, what Chris is doing up in Humboldt. Um, when I was sitting in the government ch chair, um, like we, we convinced the governor to commit $700 million plus into that project uh, because it is the most essential one. One of the other learnings from the East Coast was that like, hey, you can't just do that. There's a whole bunch of other, other ports that are needed. And I go back to the AB 525 report and say, okay, um, that port, if you look at pro the uh, report, said we probably need, you know, give or take 20 different ports, uh, and it's probably going to cost us somewhere between 11 to 12 billion dollars. All right, well, we, we're pretty clear about where two of those ports are going to go, and we're clear that they're probably going to need somewhere between six and seven billion dollars, but that leaves another 18 plus ports and another four to five billion dollars that needs to be invested into other sites across the state to fully realize our vision. So. Um, we need to start not only delivering on, on these two projects, but also starting to push on everything else. And that is one, operations and maintenance ports. So um, probably the, the, a week after we're going to need Susanna Chris's port, we're going to need an O&M port because we're going to have to tow one of those turbines off and put it out shore, and we're going to need a vessel, at least based on what we've seen on the East Coast, to be able to help start to service and commission and, and, and uh, bring that, that turbine online. So we're going to need O&M ports, probably 10 or so slots for O&M ports up and down the coast. We need to be investing in that right now. There are some great projects that are already, folks are thinking about. Um, we're involved in a lot of those conversations, but that's one. It's existential to the industry, just like mm -hmm. SNI ports. Uh, two, flexible laydown. Um, I think this is something we missed on the East Coast, that there's a lot of bits and pieces and bobs that go into an offshore wind project, and not all of them fit in the marshaling terminal, and not all of them should be at 
the staging integration or marshaling terminal. We need other spaces uh, that can be flexibly deployed within our ports network, and we're going to need them around the same time as we have the staging integration terminal. So that's kind of the, 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 uh, the third. And then manufacturing, which is not existential, but it's incredibly important, right? It is a policy choice for us to invest in projects like San Francisco and San Diego and, and Stockton and others are starting to think about um, so that we can gain local supply chain. Um, so I think those are the different types of ports that we should be thinking about. And um, you know, message one, full steam ahead with our staging integration terminals. Message two, or, or 1B, is we need to be thinking about the rest of the, the network because if you don't have the SNI ports, you don't have projects. If you don't have some of those other ports, you also don't have projects. So we, um, you mentioned the AB 525, so and this is obviously very California-centric, what we're talking about here. <clears throat> and I always like to add um, that, obviously, this is called the Pacific Offshore Wind Summit. And I know we have people here from many states, but um, we, we also believe that there's going to need to be a region-wide um, support of the by ports for the build out both of California, Oregon, and maybe Washington someday. Um, and so, but focus specifically on the AB 525. Um, we have this draft report, we've all been commenting now, um, but what do you hope, what do you really hope that this like final report has in it with respect to the roadmap for it to really be a success? and to help with the things that everyone has been hearing about today. We want to support the state laying out as specific um, items as it can for looking, looking ahead. So um, can I start with you, Chris, on that? Sure. Gosh, this is a whole new <laughs> world, right? I mean, this isn't, uh, world. I'm a boy. We used to like to build models. And you'd go and you'd get the box, you'd peel off the wrapper. It was pretty exciting. I never put the engines together. I always wanted to do the car first. But remember all the little pieces that were on the frame, and you could break them apart and pretty much put it together. And if you couldn't, uh, there was instructions, and there was a pathway to follow. We don't have that. When we say it's first of its kind, this is really first of its kind. We had the great privilege to go out to uh, Massachusetts last uh, week, or the week before last, and visit Vineyard One, uh, visit New Bedford see uh, a staging integration terminal, see an O&M port be built, or terminal be built, uh, see things installed. Um, I saw my first jack-up vessel, it's amazing. It's pretty cool. Folks, this is all new technology, this is new, and the challenges in the West are much different than the challenges on the East. Right. Um, we're gonna affect communities, lives are gonna change. In Humboldt County, we have a huge, huge challenge with our health. You know, we were, had an air quality that was littered with manufacturing for years, and while it sustained many of us, there's residual effects of us, uh, of that. We have uh, a $500,000 community-wide assessment grant funded by the US EPA to do brownfield assessment. You can see that I'm hitting kind of varied here, but that's the bottom line. We don't know what we don't know. We all learn that, you know? Remember when you were 25 and you thought you had the world figured out, and then soon you woke up and you were 35. <laughs> um, We've all been there, but that's where we're at today. And so uh, great for the state to do the work they're doing. Look at what state lands is doing on this. Look at what the California Energy Commission is doing mm -hmm. and other departments, um, Coastal Commission. Uh, we've heard from, I think from almost all of them this week, but this is just the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna come out with a final report perhaps, but we're gonna have to adjust. It's just gonna be an ever-changing scope, and we're gonna to have to be gracious with one another. None of us have been chosen as judges, so let's not judge. Yet, let's bring our talents forward, contribute to it, work in the framework provided. Uh, Suzanne, on kind of that same question? Yeah, no, and, and I love everything you said uh, there, Chris. And, you know, first, I, I definitely wanna always recognize and acknowledge the tremendous amount of effort the Energy Commission yeah. and the partners, state agencies, and even the, the partnerships with the federal agencies put into the strategic plan. It's an enormous effort. It was an enormous scope. And you know, for me, one of the very interesting and enlightening things through that process is really getting the understanding of 
you know, how the port development is really interconnected with those other pieces of the puzzle. Your model's another great analogy. Um, but, you know, the things that we do have to fit in concert. They, those pieces of the puzzle has to fit in shape, in order, and in time. Uh, and so it really does have to be a highly orchestrated sequence. Um, and so for me, within the AB525, uh, you know, clear, actionable items in a roadmap that help explain to us how ports fit in with <coughs> transmission and procurement and the, the larger supply chain and workforce development. They have to be right sized to fit yeah. to each other mm -hmm in order and in time. Uh, and so that would be hugely helpful for us to be really specific and actionable on those things. A clear, strong signals of commitment yeah. on, per, on procurement. Uh, of all the pieces of the puzzles for us, really uh, those clear signals on procurement are gonna be critical. It, it seems strange to say, but we need those clear signals from a port development standpoint as well. Yeah to help mm -hmm. us with those investments um, to, sure. to keep us moving. And to that point, um, a plan for financing, funding and financing the port, and an acknowledgement of the challenge here and, and the, the things that will need to get put into place in order to develop um, those clear signals on procurement and with the timeline for these long lead uh, major infrastructure projects, it may need other mechanisms to help uh, backstop those investments while the market is forming up. And so for me, the, the, those types of plans, very specific around that, is really gonna be helpful for us to move forward in the timeline that is needed. One thought on that, you know, it if you were here last year, I think there was, you know, everybody was talking about the four Ps. It was kind of the tagline yeah. that came out. Um, I don't know what the tagline for this year is, but maybe I'll throw out a suggestion, which is moving from targets to timelines. I think that's what we need to do, is shift from we have big goals to we have a set of a clear pathway, a heartbeat of procurements that we, we have laid out within the state. Um, and maybe it's not in the AB 525 report, but maybe it's a an yeah. annex that comes out afterwards. Like that's hard work. We understand that that's going on, but that that timeline is really important to us, and it's important to us in two respects. One, um, if we understand that timeline, we can get our designs in a place that will allow us to price to those users effectively, so they can put that into their project into the uh, their their project bids. And we're going to help de-risk the whole, the whole system, and that's going to lead to lower cost of energy. We're not going to be pricing in port risk as much into those projects. So one, on a procurement side, knowing when that procurement happens, we can adjust our design uh, and get the right information to our, our future tenants. The second thing is we need to know when projects need to use our, our sites, because the, wor yeah, it, the worst thing is that we don't have a site ready and we're the bottleneck. The second worst thing is that we have a site ready two years early. Um, which has happened to some degree on the East Coast. And we've set expectations with that community, we've set expectations politically, and now it's a bit tough to have some of those conversations on the East Coast because you have a, a very expensive piece of land and a great piece of infrastructure that doesn't have a tent on it right now. So getting the timelines and syncing that up is incredibly important, and the first step to syncing that up is having a clear heartbeat set of procurements out um, uh, for, for the state. And Sarp, I knew you had a couple of very specific thoughts too. On this. Right, I'll, I'll just I'll just add um, to what was said before too. I think you know, usually in California, we're you know uh, the first to uh, a lot of these ventures. In this case, we are a little bit lucky. We you know we have a lot of lessons learned from the East Coast and try to kind of follow that and get some cues. Um, so last year, when we saw a lot of the um, uh, the power purchase agreements canceled and that sent a lot of you know shock waves across the supply chain so as far as the um, the stability uh, you know the, the, that that piece of the the puzzle is, is pretty critical um, in terms of you know helping those those players make the right choices you, you're talking about hundreds of different tier one two and three suppliers that are going to be involved in this space and um, 
you know, they are all trying to make their investment decisions too. And you know, uh, to Brian's point, you can look at just a couple of projects right in front of you versus a lot more. If you're talking about, let's say, floating foundations, technically a facility should be able to support um, you know, a lot of lease areas and different projects too. But if they're not really clear on the horizon yet, there isn't really a way of you know, uh, um, incorporating that into your into your calculation, which then makes the, the costs change, which then ripples down, you know, the, down the food chain there to impact, you know, other elements too. So I think the, the state, you know, we heard yesterday our elected officials, um, you know, uh, talked about this extensively. It was great. They were really uh, very excited about it. I think the, you know, the grant um, proposition uh, that's that's going to be hopefully uh, you know uh, coming up this year is very exciting too. But th there could be other incentives perhaps that could be provided by the state to you know uh, um, you know help guide some of these willing enable you know investors that are on the manufacturing you know uh, mm -hmm. fabrication side of things, and uh, you know maybe get them more connected with the, the technical service providers as well um, because of. You know, uh, our systems that we're going to have to install here, they're so much larger, we'll, we'll have to, you know, develop more waterfront properties. That's right. going to be one difference. And, and a lot of those guys, you know, may not necessarily be familiar with, you know, developing new waterfront facilities <laughs> for fabrication. So that's, that's kind of novel, too. And it, it is helpful to really bring them all into the mix and, you know, uh, uh, help provide some guidance uh, and direction. So I think that would be great to see. And, in the in the roadmap going forward, um, just to have a little bit more certainty. Mm -hmm. And do you? Um, I just as we're we're getting to the end of our time here, I see, and I know we're going to have some questions. But um, Brian, was there anything else from your East Coast and West Coast experience that you wanted to add on the challenges side? Yeah, I, I think there's. We, we need to be honest, I mentioned this earlier about the scale uh, of the challenge we're talking about. So um, imagine we have a, a, one of those big fundraising thermometers next to us, and we've done really well over the last year. We have brought in probably, at a round number, $500 million for offshore wind ports in California between investments from agencies, between you know, federal dollars, state dollars. We are 4 to 5% up <laughs> in, that, in that big fundraising thermometer. We're like not even like halfway up the bowl. Like we haven't entered the long, long thin part of the thermometer yet. Like we have a long way to go um, in terms of what we need to do. Now we have a little bit of time to do that, but we need to acknowledge the scale of what's going on. Uh, on the funding side, it's incredibly exciting what the conversation is happening uh, with, with the, the ports bond. Um, yep. It's incredibly exciting to hear, uh, you know, what's going on with uh, AB 209 and uh, the, the, the grant program there for waterfront facilities through the CEC. Um, well, we need to continue to progress this conversation because without the ports, I think you, you realize pretty quickly um, you don't have projects uh, that are moving forward. And I think, um, you know, we're, when we end this this afternoon, we're going to hear from our um, friends and colleagues at the Public Utilities Commission, and I think if there's like one message that we keep hearing, it's um, these, we need a long-term clear plan with a large number that helps drive everything. And the financial implications of us not having that are probably a lot worse than the financial implications of us having that. And it's going to unlock so much. Um, can we? We have a question about how can we keep progress in these tough budget years in California. Um, who wants to take that? We're all, I think, thinking about it. Got to hold true to the iron rod. Yeah. yeah, there's a job to be done, and and we might not need to spend money. We might need. You know, everybody is afraid of collaboration. We hear the word all the time. Mm -hmm. But one of the biggest things we do with Long Beach, for example, is we talk all the time. We strategize, we work, we know what's ahead of us and what we need to do to accomplish it and why we're working for this. So there's an incredible opportunity to just do the work, hold to the iron rod, focus on the end game. Um, we want to leave an eternal life for people to come for generations and generations, but our bad behavior isn't doing that. So we've accepted the mission, let's work together and complete it. Yeah. The money will come. And I think um, 
the, uh, the elected officials need to hear that from the, the community as well. You know, uh, I'm a member of American Council of Engineering Companies representing Burns and McDonald. We were just here a few weeks ago, actually, in Sacramento, talking to a whole host of elected officials um, about the industry's needs. Offshore wind was a big topic there. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody's talking about, obviously, the, uh, the, the budget deficit and, and all that, too. And you know, we've seen that before. It goes up, up and down. And our constant message was, you know, let's just keep our eye on the ball. We need you know, the, uh, the funding for the infrastructure investments untouched here, because you know, if anything happens there, that's going to set us back many, many years. And you know, we're going to be right back to the positive you know, uh, next time. We've always been there before. And, um, and it's going to be really hard to recuperate at that point. I think the message is really getting there, but um, you know, the communication is key. So uh, you know, the, we're all moving towards the same goal. Um, yeah. You know, and the policy session leads the way. Great. Well, um, thank you all. I think we're almost we're at lunch, and I I guess I leave you all with. I mean, California. We built that our amazing highway system. We built our amazing university system, and we need um, this effort to be seen in that same way, because we're going to rebuild our manufacturing and a lot of other things if we can build out this um, port infrastructure for economic development. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you.